Be Wealthy and Smart, episode 103. into a world of wealth and financial freedom without budgets, boredom, or bosses on Be Wealthy and Smart. And now, here's your host, Linda P. Jones. Welcome to Be Wealthy and Smart. I'm Linda P. Jones, America's Wealth Mentor, empowering women and men worldwide to financial freedom. On today's episode, we have two phenomenal guests, Joe Salcihai and Kathleen Selmans from Stacking Benjamins, a very popular financial podcast and blog, and we're talking about ways to save money in 2016, and specifically ways to save as much as 50% of your income with automated systems so you can save it easily and effortlessly and meet your savings goals. What you'll learn are why it's possible to save 50%, why hiding money from yourself is a good idea, and how to get your employer to give you a raise. At the end, we'll let you know about a special discount for my listeners, how to join the savings challenge if you so desire. Here we go. I'm so excited today to have Joe Salcihai and Kathleen Selmans on the show. We're going to talk about how to ramp up and save 50% of your income in the new year. How are you doing, Joe and Kathleen? Hey, thanks for having us. You're welcome. Kathleen? Hey, great to have you here. I'm so excited to talk about this because you guys have been working on a really cool project to get people to save more, and we're going to give people some ideas today on how they can save more money because, you know, saving a nest egg is step two of my six steps to wealth. So this is a huge step before people can start investing. They really need to start saving. So I'm really excited to talk about this today. Well, and this is the year to do it, right? I mean, every year people start off and they go to the gym or they say, I'm going to start something new. But if you really say to yourself, this is 2016 is where I put my foot down, Linda. I mean, this is the time. The time is now, not tomorrow, not next week, not next year. I'm going to actually do something big. I'm going to make the goal huge. That's how That's how good things happen. Absolutely. And I think people have been you know, conscious about their spending is how I'll put it. Uh, More conscious as we've been in this great recession and as that continues to unfold, people are really thinking, especially around the holidays now, I'm I'm hearing people say, do I really need this? I don't really want gifts or I don't want to go to this extreme like we have in the past or I want to be really conscious about what we're giving for gifts. Are you hearing people really focus on that too? I am. I hear that. I I see that all over Facebook. People are giving experiences instead of physical objects. They're opting out of the required employee gift exchange, all of those things. Yeah, we've we've seen on the podcast. I mean, we had this this woman on the Second Benjamin Show recently who... um, has a company where you can give gifts of stock. And when you see people that want more experiences or want to give gifts, you know, instead of giving gifts that are depreciating assets or they just throw them away right away, giving something that's going to actually appreciate is really exciting or something that's going to help me get ahead. You know, that's where we're seeing the excitement is. Yeah, and that's where it's been kind of fun because every time Christmas rolls around, since the price of silver has been kind of low, I've been talking to people about buying some silver coins and giving them, you know, even to children or just putting it as a stocking stuffer or something, which is, you know, something that actually has the potential to increase in value. And what a great gift that can be. I thought you were going to talk about giving silver and giving it to you, Linda. (laughs) No. (laughs) No. But, but yeah, you're right. I mean, anytime we can give a gift that's going to appreciate in value or it's going to be something that uh, that is going to add to the nest egg, especially, I agree with you, especially for kids, because kids get so much junk. I mean, I remember I have twins that are now 20, Ugh. and, and when, uh, when they were young, we'd give them a toy, and of course, they throw the toy to the side and they play with a wrapper, right? <laughs> That's cute. Well, I think that, you know, when we're talking about kids, the best thing we can do to teach kids is to be a good role model ourselves. So for the parents to really be good savers and teaching the kids about saving and investing at a young age, which, you know, I had some of that happen with me at a young age, and it really made an impression on me. 
That's funny because the impetus for our whole Save 50 movement is exactly the opposite. Kathleen and I were talking about this. And <laughs> Kathleen, why don't you tell me your story about uh, how this actually started? Because it actually didn't start from like you were talking about, Linda. It started from more of a place of weakness. Right. So not that I had a bad money upbringing. I just got to make all of my own mistakes. And I woke up a few years ago on my 30th birthday and I had $25,000 in credit card debt. And I thought, okay, now I'm a real grown up. I need to get my head act together, my head in the game. I need to start paying off this debt. This has to be gone. And I started paying it off really rapidly. I started my blog, Frugal Portland, started writing about debt, started writing about meal planning and all that kind of thing. And I came across an article that said, you should aim to save 50% of your income. And I thought, okay, yeah, okay, sure. I'm going to be paying all this off, but yeah, all right. And then uh, I got to talking to a couple of friends. So they said, you know, it counts if you're not increasing your debt, you can count your debt repayment as savings. And so I did the math and that year I'd earned $33,000. And by the end of the year, I had saved effectively 47% of my income. And I thought, well, okay, if I can do this while I'm not making very much money, then this can help a lot of people who are making less or more get ahead and really change their lives. Wow. Now, how was your living situation? Because I think most people's largest expense is going to be their rent or their mortgage. So what was your living situation? I lived in a one bedroom apartment by myself. And that was one of the things I didn't want to give up. I really liked that apartment. Um, So I wasn't I didn't have a, a mortgage yet or anything. But that's funny because we do talk about uh, that your housing expenses are the most expensive of all. And when we were walking people through how to save 50 percent, so for some people, as you know, Linda, it comes down to some tough situations. And that is specifically looking at where you live. Exactly. I know when I lived in New York City a long time ago, it was very expensive and it was a much bigger percentage of my income than when I had lived in Seattle or in San Francisco. So depending on where people live, I know that's going to be one of their concerns is that their cost of living might be higher. Um, and so we just want to you know, talk about what are these thoughts that they might have that they can't do it because they might say, oh, well, I live in New York City and my rent is so expensive. How could I possibly save 50% of my income? What do you say to well- that? Well, that's a that's a big one. And so what we look at is not just where you live in the United States or wherever you live, the community you live in. I mean, I live in Texarkana, but just the Texas, which is not known for, you know, huge price per square foot. But we even talk a little bit about re-looking at that cost per square foot argument, because there are people that live in these giant sized houses where the houses aren't really all functional. And do you really need all that space that you have? And so we've had a nice resurgence in the econ- in a lot of economies when it's come to real estate. And if you really want to save more money, should you live where you live or should you live someplace else? And I'll give you an example. We, we, Kathleen and I both really love this this set of books. Have you heard about the Not So Big House books? No. There's a series by these architects called The Not-So-Big House, and it's a fantastic series of these gorgeous, gorgeous houses. But what they talk about is this whole cost-per-square-foot argument is flawed, right? That that people have, people have these McMansions, and half of it is a living room that is no longer used, because in the early 1900s, we used it as this, this, you know, this sitting area where people of society would sit. And now it's this room that's pristine that nobody goes into. And then we have these formal dining rooms that the same thing. We used to have these formal dinner parties. Nobody's there. And if you've ever been to parties at people's houses or maybe, I don't know, maybe listeners have this house, half the rooms are empty. And where's everybody gathered? In the kitchen, right? Right. (laughs) (laughs) And so now when you look at houses, instead of cost per square foot, look at a house that maybe has less square footage, but it has that open concept where the, the, the entertainment area all kind of spills into each other. And as you look at newer houses, they tend to get rid of a lot of this space. And instead, it's a it's a it's a smaller house that gives you a lower heating bill, gives you maybe a lower lot that you can live on. Maybe you can can pay less uh, money for your house and still have a better living experience for yourself. I mean, that's a that's a huge expense that maybe you maybe you need to look at. Also, though, Kathleen, well, just as a personal story, your sister right uh, changed where she lived, kind of like Linda's talking about. Right. So I live in Portland, Oregon. 
And my sister did too until about a year ago and she was working as a teacher and so she wasn't making very much money and she was not very happy with Portland and she decided that she was going to move. She was going to change her situation. And we did the math together and between the fact that she went from teaching to working in educational sales and the fact that she moved from Portland to San Antonio, she gave herself something like a 60% raise. And San Antonio is not a bad city to live in. I mean, that's a that's a fantastic place. But when people give us the argument that, you know what, let, to specifically answer your question, Linda, uh, people give us the argument, well, you know what, where I live, uh, there's still th- are things you can do. You're just going to have to look hard. It depends on how bad you really want it. Yes, absolutely. And so many people, you know, you mentioned credit card debt, Kathleen, but so many people have uh, school debt, you know, college debt, unfortunately, that they're, you know, just feeling trapped with. And it's something that you can't get rid of. I mean, even if you go bankrupt, you can't get it, it, you know, the court doesn't excuse it. So it's really something that people are feeling a weight around their neck. Is this something that is going to help them get out of that as well? Absolutely. Because what we're what we're doing is we're trying to get rid of every roadblock, right? You, you, you come across that a lot when somebody says, I saved half my income. You're like, Oh, well, great. Did you make $500,000 a year? Congratulations. Cause you think it's easy at a higher point than you're at until you start working on that goal. Then those, those, but what ifs keep coming up and you work through them individually you, you know, you re-question your values, you wonder what you can do, and it helps to figure out why you want to save that much money and what you want to do with your life when you're saving that much money. Well, and people are also closer than they think. I mean, a lot of that money that's going towards student loan, the part that's not interest, Linda, that counts. That counts as saving half your income because really it is savings because there's an interest rate you're paying on that debt. Mm -hmm. So if you're not taking on new debt, we show people how to count that money. And man, you're a lot closer to 50% than you thought. Yeah. So if you're not paying the 10%, you're earning the 10%. Right. Absolutely. That's right. Yep. I agree with that. Absolutely. So is this complicated for people to do? Is Is this time consuming? Like, People are probably thinking, oh, my gosh, I'm going to have to make major changes. This is going to be really uncomfortable. You know, it's that whole concept of feeling restricted. What do you think about that? How do you how do they counteract that? I know it's so funny because you think like, okay, well, I could save half my income if I sell my house and move to a tent in the park. (laughs) Yeah, but it's not it's not it doesn't have to be that hard. Um, Although you you asked if it was complicated, it's simple. But making it simple doesn't mean it's easy. Right. And and that means that what we teach people how to do is how to make, and potentially for people that haven't done this before, using simple concepts like how to hide money from yourself, right? Mm -hmm. And we show you how to get the money hidden. We don't focus a lot on the investing side, Linda. That's what you do here in this podcast and with your programs. We don't focus on that. We show people how to, number one, capture the money, which is really one one of two ways. Number one is looking at reducing expenses. And this isn't rocket science, but we show people lots of different ways to reduce expenses. And I just gave you the big one, which is the house. Well, people don't really want to do that if they don't have to. But if I can look at my utility bills differently, if I can maybe look at my gift giving practices differently, if those are what it takes to get to the 50% number and that's all that you need to do, then it's going to be even easier. But you already know that once you capture that money supposedly by not giving gifts the same way or by not spending as much on your utility bill, you still haven't actually captured it. For a lot of people, that money goes in one pocket and then goes right out to some other thing. Maybe I go out to dinner more often. So what we do is we show you how to hide it from yourself so that that money's no longer available and now it's going to you instead of going to the next creditor. I love that idea. Hide it from yourself. You know, because yeah. it, it's true. I mean, if you see that money in your bank account, it's like, oh, hey, I've got this extra money. I can go do <laughs> Let's this. Let's go to or, Tahiti. <laughs> yeah, I can go spend it there. I can buy that new pair of shoes I wanted, or I can buy those golf clubs or go play golf. Or well, one strategy that, that we really like is, it comes from when I was a financial advisor. When I was a financial advisor, people who couldn't save, I would help them set up this separate bank account that was in Minneapolis. And my practice was in Detroit. And it's... <laughs> 
<laughs> and we would not give people ATM access. Now, don't get me wrong, it's their money, right? So people are agreeing to this strategy before we do it. So uh, I wasn't just Joe, cruel guy. We'd set it up in Minneapolis. We wouldn't have ATM access. And then money would leave their check when they got paid. We would have some of their money direct deposited and go to Minneapolis. And when they needed money, they had a couple choices. If it was really a super emergency, they would have to pay a fee, you know, to have money overnighted. And that was bad. But if it's really an emergency, who cares? If it's not an emergency, they had to wait three to five days for the money to show up uh, as a as a check. This is and that kind of shows how old I am. <laughs> you know, we didn't we didn't have all the technology that we have now. But what was cool was if you knew, Linda, that you couldn't get your money for three to five days, guess what happened? It stayed there. And it was so cool having this this account that was that was harder to get to for beginning savers um, that that the money would just pile up and so we teach people how to kind of do that yourself I love that I love that because people need help kind of you know keeping themselves under control if you will <laughs> and it's funny but sometimes we just don't really have the willpower we need some sort of outside source to help us even if we're you know, signing over control to them to do it for us. So, right. and that's actually one of our main pillar. One of the pillars of the second Benjamin's philosophy is that it doesn't take willpower. None of this takes willpower. It just takes systems. And here's one. Yeah, I like that. I like that. And with technology now, I'm, I imagine there's a lot of great systems you could put together. Way yeah, easier. we have one really cool. I was just on the phone with um, the person who's building our spreadsheet, and this it's a really, really cool spreadsheet that helps you break out different categories and mark them as which percentage of that goes to savings, and it'll show you month by month how, how you're doing. It's really neat. But listen to this. I mean, for people that for people that don't want to take our course, that's fine. But, but just challenge yourself to do something bigger. I think is something huge. And then looking at technology uh, to help you do things using using techniques to hide money from yourself. These are things that everybody can do. Um, and if you use the fact that it's the new year as this impetus to go get something new for yourself, I think it's pretty awesome. I love that Michelangelo quote that it's not about setting your goals too high and not reaching them. It's about setting your goals way too low and reaching all of them, right? That's the problem. Mm, I like that. Yeah, definitely. So what about the income side of the equation? Because it's all well and good to try and reduce expenses. But I know that, you know, I'm pretty good at reducing expenses, looking at all my costs and seeing what do I really need? What's my priority? So how do you recommend people who are pretty good on the expense side look at the income side? Because I think that's something that's not talked about in our industry enough is how to increase your income. Do you have ideas for people on that? We do. We do. We, we talk about ways to increase your income at work, um, around the neighborhood, uh, online. We have lots of ideas for brainstorming ways to make more money. And, and there's a great quote by a guy who used to be, I think he was the CEO at Sears uh, a long time ago, before Sears was what it is now. And he said his, his, his board was trying to tell him over and over to shrink the company. By the way, it just as an addendum to that, he ended up getting fired because he refused to keep shrinking the company and look at where Sears is now, right? Uh, but he said to his board, you can't shrink your way to greatness. And I sometimes feel like that's what we're doing when we're just focused on the expense side. So increasing income, if, if you can increase income through what you're doing now, which which as Kathleen said, we already talked about, uh, that's step one. And if not, we'll show you different ways to, to, to make money. And by the way, the ways to make money depend more on you than on our strategy. So what we go over is where and what people should think about is where is your you know, where's your passion? Where's your love? Sometimes I think passion's overplayed, but if you start there and then you calculate what that return on increasing that, you know, the amount of time and the amount of energy you put toward that pursuit is, uh, maybe you can turn your passion into more money. I definitely think so. And, you know, I just think that there's so much opportunity now with the internet than what we had before that I really encourage people to have a side hustle and that may not be something that will pay off necessarily this year in their savings, you know, and their ability to earn more and save more. 
But over time, it's going to make a huge difference. I just, here's something, yeah. here's something though, immediately for people, Linda, even without doing that, which I'm totally on board with you, you look at the statistics about women especially, how many women have not asked their bosses for a raise if they're working the standard nine to five. Kathleen and I looked at these statistics, and it's absolutely horrible. Um, and there's a ton of opportunity, and not just for women, by the way, for men and women, to, to take a look at what you're really bringing to the company and seeing if the work that you're doing already, are you getting paid what you're worth or could you be paid more for for what you're worth? And I think for a lot of people, there's opportunity right there. As long as you stay away from with your boss, don't make emotional arguments. If you come into your boss's office and you say something like, I need more money because I'm trying to save 50%, your boss doesn't care about that. (laughs) But, But if you write down all the things that you're worth to the company and all the things you could do if you were paid more money, like the, the opportunity, you know, if somebody gave you the opportunity, and by the way, I'm going to want more money if I'm going to do even more work, uh, you might be better off for your company and be better, you know, be a better employee and make more money. And by the way, if you start positioning it that way, I want to be even more valuable to the company. You and your boss now are on the same side, especially in a bigger company, where your boss then is going to be on your team looking to get you more money with their boss. Mm. You know, there was a statistic that I read about that as well, that uh, women weren't as comfortable knowing what they were worth. Oh, that's so, horrible. Yeah. I, they, you know, if the men said that, that the job was worth X amount, then that sort of set the bar. But the women weren't as confident saying what that number was that they were worth. And so I think that, you know, there's there are different ways that we think and different ways that we process things. And yeah, that's something that I would be very encouraging to women to uh, step up and ask for that extra income for sure. Yeah, and then beyond that, then do what you're talking about, Linda, which is side hustles. I mean, side hustles don't have to be a grind. They can be something you already love. And let's see if we can make money doing it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I had a client once who was a young woman, and she was um, a Pilates instructor. And she was in a lot of debt. And she lived on her own. And she was like, Oh, I'm just drowning in this debt. I spent half the time, you know, with my boyfriend who's in another city. And I just haven't worked on this. And I just I'm so frustrated. I don't know what to do. And I said to her, Well, you know, do you have any other talents or skills? And she said, Well, yeah, you know, I used to do some modeling of sports gear. And I said, do you still have that connection? And she said, yeah, I do. And I said, well, can you contact them and see if you could do some more work? And so she did. And then she also uh, decided that she could rent out one of the bedrooms in her apartment since she really wasn't spending much time there. She was at her boyfriend's place more. And between those two things, she had all of her debt paid off within a year. Cool. Isn't that exciting? It's just about looking at your resources you already have differently. Yeah, she already already yeah. had all of this within her grasp. We just hadn't thought about it. It was just a matter of changing her way of thinking. I had a problem when I was in college that uh, I was paying my own way through school, um, and I really didn't want to take out a, a lot of student loans. So I was working uh, three jobs, and at the same time, I was uh, taking classes, and I was still struggling to make ends meet. I remember listening to this radio show, and this woman called in and said, we're, we're very much struggling. We can't make this happen. I don't know what to do. And the radio host said, what are you doing? between midnight and 8 a.m. And the woman started laughing. She said, I'm sleeping. And he said, well, maybe there's your problem. And, and she said, what are you talking about? He said, well, you called me and you're complaining about the amount of money that you're making and you, things aren't the way you want them to be. And yet you're spending all this time sleeping. And I'm not telling your listeners, Linda, not to sleep. Right. I'm just saying that she had this eight hours of time. And when I heard that, you know what I did? I went out and I delivered papers. And in hindsight, maybe that, maybe that wasn't the best use of my time. I think I, I think now I probably have better strategies than I had then. But but even barring great strategies, just waking up three hours earlier and going out and delivering papers was a way to make that little extra money I needed to make sure I didn't get into massive debt. You know, the, the funny thing about paper boys and, and paper deliverers is that they very often turn out to be financially successful later in life. Is that true? That's I have seen that time and time again. 
Absolutely. I'll tell you what, I still uh, look at the world differently after it's amazing. You knew where all the dogs were. You, you knew who was up that morning and who was really annoyed if the paper just wasn't just so. And if it was if it was a uh, there weren't clouds. If it was a clear night, that meant it was going to be colder. So the first thing I would do when I when I got up at, at four in the morning was I would look up and see if it was a clear sky. Because if it was freezing and it was the winter in Michigan, I was screwed. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> but it's funny how everybody has a point of view, right? All this stuff I would have never thought about. They do. But there is something to getting up earlier to do whatever it is that you really want to do. Because when I was building my stock portfolio and having a lot of success with that, I was getting up at five in the morning to do that. And I was a, Kathleen's up early. How, what time do you get up, Kathleen? I get up between five and six every morning. That's insane. So what motivates you to do that, Kathleen? Uh, the dog. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, before when I had... Uh, when Stephanie Benjamins was my side hustle, I would get up and do a bunch of Stephanie Benjamins work and then work on my day job. And now that I, I'm working on Stephanie Benjamins full time, it's funny because I'm still way more productive before 10 a.m. than I am the entire rest of the day. Well, and it yeah. sounds like, Linda, that's your story, too. That's right. That's exactly right. And for anyone who doesn't know, Stacking Benjamins is a, an incredibly successful podcast and website. And uh, so that started as a side hustle for you, huh? Yep. <laughs> for me, not mm-hmm. for Joe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So how did that develop from a side hustle to a full-time, just for anyone who hasn't had a side hustle and would like to do that? Do you have any advice for them on how to do that? Yeah, there are two ways to go about doing that. And the first is make as much make as much money on your side hustle as you're making in your day job, and then it's a no-brainer, Right. Um, but for me, it was a little different because I wasn't making as much money as I was in my day job, but also I wasn't able to work on the things that I wanted to work on. And my day job was as a blog manager for a company. And so it hurt even more that I was blogging all day and someone else was getting all of that reward. I wasn't seeing paid views. I wasn't seeing, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, so for, for me, when Joe and I partnered together and brought all of our websites under the same roof, I said, look, I, I think I need to give notice. And Joe said, well, okay, let's talk about it. And then we crunched the numbers, we made some plans, and just decided together that with the two of us working on it full time, there's no way we can fail. Yeah, and you got to be very careful about the, and, and we were definitely very careful about what that crossover point's going to be, right? Because mm-hmm. if you're going to take on a job for less money, you have to make sure that the bottom's not going to fall out later on. Mm-hmm. And Kathleen or, and I are on your show a year from now screaming at each other. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It'll be a different kind of show next time. Yeah. Right. <laughs> No, that's awesome. Well, that's incredible that you have done so much of this experience. I mean, the two of you have like really amazing experience. Joe, you as a planner doing this for other people and Kathleen, you doing this in your own life and experiencing, you know, going from a side hustle to a full time position, which I just, you know, really encourage people to explore those opportunities now because there's just this side and probably the, the, the three of us know it and a lot of our listeners know it, but a lot of our listeners don't know that there's this new way of technology that allows people to develop a lot of very profitable companies without a lot of expenditure. So for the first time, you don't have to have a whole lot of money to start a business. And it's a really exciting time. And I really enjoy watching a lot of people in our industry get to multiple six figures, seven figures pretty quickly in just a few short years through this new technology and these new business models. And I just think it's a really astounding and exciting time to start a business. Uh, Yeah, I agree. So anything else that we should be telling people that they can do to save half their income? Man, so it, well, in the course we start off with uh, with what counts as half, and we talked about that, and then cutting expenses. We talked a few of those ways, increasing your income, hiding money from yourself. You know what? It, it really isn't super complicated. I mean, like Kathleen said, it's it's not easy, but the systems are really things that are right in front of you, and it's about holding on, making sure that you're not focusing on all the all the outside stuff. Because you know what's going to happen, Linda, and maybe this is 
the point. Maybe this is the, the, the big one. When, when you get excited about something, it's, it's really simple. But then real life starts to take over again, right? Yeah. So, and that's where it's not about discipline. It's about systems. If you can set up those systems really quickly while you're excited, once that excitement <laughs> fades, and it will, at that point, the systems are already in place. And then you're also working with behavioral economics because guess what? Internally, many of us are pretty lazy. We'd rather do something later. And if I've already set up a system, I'd rather leave the system the way it is than, than change it, right? And if I set it up to make me win, I'm more likely to keep winning because uh, I can't be bothered to go switch things around again. I like that. I like that a lot. I think that makes a lot of sense because most people give up on their New Year's resolutions within, what? what is it, like 10 days or something crazy? I mean, it's... Certainly by the end of January. Yeah, exactly. I mean, well, because think about going to the gym, let's say. Getting up at, at 5 a.m. or whatever to go to the gym, that's exciting at first, so we do it. But then three weeks later when that excitement's gone, getting up to go to the gym is very difficult. You don't want your financial stuff to be that way. And like you said, Linda, with all the cool technology that's out there, it doesn't have to be that way. You can wake up whenever the heck you want, your money will still do the right thing. And if we set up our money to do the right thing automatically, and we don't have to think about it, then our brain can't mess it up for us. Boy, this is really exciting stuff, because you've really thought through what people can do and how to make this foolproof for people. Isn't that scary? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. <laughs> so tell people, so this is a challenge to save half your income. When does it start and when does it end? Kathleen? The course opens January 1st, and it's open until January 29th. We're going to leave it open in January, and then we're going to take 2016 by storm. Wow. And so this is something you're going through with them for the whole year, or how are you? So you're setting this up in the first month, and then it goes on autopilot the rest of the year, or how does that That's work? the idea. It's, okay. it, that's the idea. It's a five modules full of lessons that teach you all the things we just talked about. Um, and once you, and it's self guided. So once you go through it, you mark things off, you do the homework. Once you're done with the course, you should be all set up for the rest of the year. And because you may need some motivation, we have a closed Facebook group for the group. So we can continue to, to answer questions for people in the trenches. Sometimes people have technical issues that we might not have covered. Other times people just need a little pat on the back and a go get them, you know? Yeah, that's nice to have a community where people can come together and yeah. collaborate and share successes and and, right. and frustrations. And things at, the, like that. at the same time, we didn't want to make it something where you had to show up Wednesday at seven for the yeah. class. Yeah. You can do it. Once again, talking about technology, there's enough technology that should be able to do this on your own. So we have the Facebook group on one side so that you get the camaraderie and your questions answered like you want. And then you can still do it at your own pace, depending on how your schedule allows. I love that. I think that's phenomenal. All right. So for them to get more information, they can go to BeWealthyAndSmart.com forward slash save half. S-A-V-E-H-A-L-F. And we have, we've, we've decided that your listeners at Be Wealthy and Smart were going to, and, and by the way, it's not a huge uh, uh, amount of money, Linda, but every little bit helps. And, um, and we have uh, given your listeners a discount. So you can tell people about that too, if you'd like. Okay, so they will get a 10% discount off the price. The price of challenging yourself to save half in the new year is one twenty nine, and they'll save ten percent, so they'll save twelve dollars and ninety cents, almost a lucky thirteen. What's that line from that old uh, that old Christmas song that ten bucks is ten bucks? You know, so yeah, it's thirteen dollars, but hey, that's thirteen dollars less that you have to save. So do you and count that in the savings already? <laughs> <laughs> You know, you, you know what we do find though, and we found through our our beta testers, is that people make up the cost of the course in the first two modules. So the the next three modules are, you know, are icing on the cake. I mean, very very quickly you make up the small price of the course. We didn't want to make this an expensive course. We want to make it very inexpensive because generally this is for people that are having trouble saving and just can't seem to find a way to to save the amount of money that they think they can. Doesn't matter what your income is. But if, if you're one of those people that just 
you know, you're tired of talking about saving 5%, maybe increasing it to 6%, maybe doing like Kathleen did and go to 50. And let's see if you can do that. And let's say that you fail, Linda, and you only save 47. How bad does that stink? (laughs) Well, and you know, I want to, I want to say it's not just for people that have a tough time saving. I think it's for people that just want to save. Good point. You know, because no matter what your income level is, you might want to save more. You might, you might have that goal to save more. And, you know, it is that second step of wealth building is to save your nest egg. So you need to have a nest egg before you can really invest. And that's an important piece of it. So for those people that are excited to get started investing and those people who need to save something and want to save more, I think at any income level, this makes incredible sense. And probably the, you know, the higher the income level, obviously, the more discretionary income they might have. But I think at any income level, it makes sense to put these systems in place and have this on autopilot. It just will save you a lot of money, not just next year, but over years and years and years. And what is that? When you compound that out, that can be a huge number for people. It is. And I hope that people, whether you take our course or not, if you're not hiding money from yourself, you should start doing that. If you're not thinking about the, your expenses, you you know, there's tons of spreadsheets out there, not just our cool one at the course that you can use. If you use the start of the year to start implementing some of these systems, you, you can save way more money than you ever thought. I love it. I love Well, you guys are you guys talk me into it. I mean, I, I love it. I'm loving it. <laughs> So, all right. So then go to BeWealthyAndSmart.com forward slash save half. Thank you so much, Joe and Kathleen, for being on the show today. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much, Linda. Thanks a ton. You're welcome. Joe and Kathleen are so fun, and they're providing a great service to help you save as much as half of your income. Whether you're paying off credit card debt, student loans, or just want to save a nest egg to invest, why not make it foolproof so you can reach your goals in 2016? I can't think of anything smarter than to automate your systems to save so you don't have to even think about it. Put your saving success on autopilot and make 2016 the year you get rid of debt around from around your neck. Get those bills paid off or just watch your money accumulate faster and effortlessly. Don't forget, there's also a 10% discount for being a Be Wealthy and Smart listener. For your 10% discount, go to this podcast, number 103, on the BeWealthyAndSmart.com website and click on the link to sign up. Since you know the name of my podcast and you know this offer is about saving half your income, you can remember it by putting the two together for the URL. It's BeWealthyAndSmart.com forward slash save half, H-A-L-F. Again, that's BeWealthyAndSmart.com save half. Until next time, live the good life and be wealthy and smart. Thank you for listening to Be Wealthy and Smart with Linda P. Jones. Share the wealth and tell your family and friends about the show. Check out our website, blog, and social media for more riches at www.bewealthyandsmart.com.